Hello, this is Saul Luckman, and I'd like to welcome you to Saul Luckman Uncensored, sponsored by snooze2awaken.com, resources for lucidity. You can follow Saul Luckman Uncensored on BitChute, YouTube, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Breaker, Pocket Cast, Radio Public, and many other sites. For, for more information about my work, including a lot of fantastic free content, check out crowrising.com. Today, I have a very special guest indeed. For me, she's really a rock star. Kelly Brogan, MD, is a holistic psychiatrist. She's author of the New York Times bestselling book, A Mind of Your Own, Own Yourself, which I highly recommend. And she's also co-editor of the landmark textbook, Integrative Therapies for Depression. She's the founder of the extremely popular online healing program, Vital Mind Reset, which I've experienced and is really good stuff. She completed her psychiatric, psychiatric training and fellowship at NYU Medical Center after graduating from Cornell University Medical College, all these little technical, you know, community colleges, and has a BS from MIT in systems neuroscience. She has specialized in a root cause resolution approach to psychiatric syndromes and symptoms. Her website is www.kellybroganmd.com. Please do visit that. It's amazing. And uh, welcome to Saul Luckman Uncensored, Dr. Kelly. It's such a pleasure and an honor to speak with you today. Likewise, it's really a pleasure. And thank you for that beautiful intro. Well, um, you know, I followed your work for a long time and I, I wanted to actually give uh, listeners uh, uh, some, some proof of that. I, I, I'm going to share just some blog titles of yours <laughs> on my blog, it's News to Awaken, that I've put, posted over the years. And it kind of gives this snapshot of the range of your thinking and maybe to some degree the evolution of your thinking over time uh so all the way back in 2016 i published an article of yours or republished uh three scientific game changers that will transform medicine and then why another article why social isolation leads to inflammation and then the violence inducing effects of psychiatric medication five <laughs> rules for eating away your depression you know, these are really uh, amazing and there's such diversity here. It's incredible. And then moving uh, on, on into the future here, closer to where we are now, um, there was um, uh, one where I focused on your work with uh, Dr. Bear Lando and Dr. Kaufman, uh, three brilliant and compassionate medical doctors share their perspectives on questioning COVID. And then you uh, did this amazing article, uh, why we stay asleep when COVID-19 is trying to wake us up. And then masks, have you been captured by this PSYOP? An open letter on internet censorship that you wrote. And uh, then uh, you wrote something relatively recently. It's a PDF. Is HIV to AIDS what SARS-CoV-2 is to COVID? And then I, I wrote an article about you a, a couple of weeks ago, not even, about the presentation you gave at a healing, a recent healing conference. And I said, the real reason why so many people are acting like sheeple, Dr. Kelly Brogan and Fuego. <laughs> <laughs> because you were, so, you were so articulate and on point in that presentation, it was mind blowing. Lee looked at me, my partner, she said, my God, she speaks so beautifully. It was an amazing thing to just listen to and tap into. That's amazing. Normally, when people say they wrote an article about me, it's not always complimentary. So yeah, well, that I means a lot that. to me. Thank you. I get it. Yeah. Well, I'm not one of those. I'm 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 a huge fan, and I love your range, and I love your your humanity and the way you you put the science and the spirituality together. It's something that I try to do yes. to some degree in my own work, and it's um it's not easy in today's world because they are so compartmentalized. Yes. Yes. So how have because, you fought yeah. that 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 trend? How have you stepped into you know the what's the what's the reader reader's digest version of how you got to where you are in terms of living a more holistic life? I suppose. Mm. I I think that it's possible I incarnated to <laughs> experience extreme polarity. You know, I think all of us probably to some extent incarnated you know, to, to have the experience of contrast, um, maybe to be our own alchemists in the lab of our, you know, human experience. In my particular journey, I mean, I have been on 
you know, opposite sides of the spectrum to such an extreme that you could actually, you know, assume that maybe I haven't even landed yet because um, I'm still sort of pendulating between um, these these very extreme, you know, like last year, I hated cats. This year, I have two cats who are like deities in my home. <laughs> you know, like mm. my, my medical journey um, is, is like the tale of two cities. You know, I, I uh, was raised by an immigrant mother and anybody who has immigrant parents knows that, you know, there is often a, a narcissistic extension phenomenon where the, the handing down of the burden of justification for leaving the motherland is, is brought upon the child who then has to make it worth it, right? So you become a doctor, you become a lawyer. Um, my parents um, did an incredible job in many, many ways, uh, encouraging me to, you know, sort of um, cultivate a a work ethic, you know, uh, but really it was about external validation of, you know, the intelligence that they told me that I had, etc. And I went to college, to medical school um, with that hierarchical sort of illusory, like once I get here, once I get here, once I get here, I'll be okay. And I chased that all the way until uh, my fellowship level training when I had that, that first profound experience of cognitive dissonance, that first rupture of empathy, where I saw that the system I had devoted many years of my blood, sweat, and tears to $200,000 of debt and all the rest of it, indoctrination, um, seemed to betray me, right? And I've heard it said that betrayal is just the unwillingness to see what was already shown. And I, I think that's probably very true in my case. But I, I felt this kind of uh, adolescent betrayal uh, by the medical system when I was diagnosed with my first potentially chronic condition, uh, postpartum, my first pregnancy, Hashimoto's thyroiditis. And right. I had been <laughs> totally uninterested in anything related to self-care uh, or anything that we would now call lifestyle medicine because I hadn't had any incentive to explore that. Um, you know, I, I kind of treated my body like a dumpster and I didn't have any of the socially unacceptable sequelae, right? So I, I've always been thin, whether I was eating McDonald's seven days a week or none. Um, and I was in that kind of tired but wired adrenal <laughs> burnout phase All right. uh, that I just juiced up with six cups of coffee and it seemed to be working. You know, I was also in my 20s. So you can get away with a lot more then. And one second yeah. and just comment on the extreme, I don't know, the extreme parallels of, of our stories. I, yes. came from a, I came from a, a, a sort of a Southern Appalachian family. And, you know, my way of, of proving myself was to go beyond that little limited redneck world. Yes. out into academia and end up, ended up, you know, with big scholarships and doing Ivy League dissertation work and all of this stuff. And, and then my health broke down. Yes. I mean, it's just amazing. I, it's, it's like a type of journey that I yes. know so well. And when you say it, it just, it almost makes me uncomfortable just to remember the intensity of my blindness and then the intensity of the awakening when everything mm -hmm. began to crumble. But you still had a choice, right? And so did I to resolve that dissonance through denial, right? When I when I saw on paper, <laughs> you know, that I put my Hashimoto's into remission by essentially taking gluten and dairy out of my diet, taking a couple of vitamins, I uh, I could have said, oh well, it's just an exception, or that's funny, it was probably going to go away anyway, or you know. I, uh, I was just in, in one of these outlier categories of postpartum thyroiditis that spontaneously, you know, resolves. I could have made a hundred excuses as we do when we're not ready to relume the fabric of our reality. Mm. And I think it was only because uh, on a soul level, I recognized that I couldn't stay one more minute <laughs> in, in that old me, in the skin of that illusory self, um, that I said, you know, I'll ride the wave of rage into the next chapter. How about that? That's our compromise. <laughs> you know, so so that's what I did. You know, I wasn't like, oh, my God, I healed myself. This is amazing. The body is beautiful. It was not like that at all. I, I was so enraged, um, so indignant, and had such 
a geyser of righteous indignation flowing through the core of my being that I, you know, stormed out of the castle and went on this relentless hunt <laughs> for, you know, uh, the enemy's, you know, sort of grounds. And so you, you wrote a mind of your own in that way, right? Yes, from that, very from that much standpoint. So. Yeah, those hundreds of references at the back are like bullets, you know? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. yeah, and it was from that, you know, energy, that kind of Joan of Arc, Sword Aloft kind of vibe that I felt um, almost even probably a grandiosity. Like, I am here to take down this this industry, right? You know, pharma is no match for me. I'm I'm awake, alive, and I'm I'm coming, you know, kind of thing. And as I started to collect activists around me who were in some dimensions, I had a, a lot of trouble before I met Sayer, um, really encountering anybody who had a comprehensive perspective on activism, you know, that applied across disciplines, like, you know, from GMOs to home birth to, you know, pharmaceuticals to vaccines to psychiatry, you know, all of it. Uh, sort of pulling all the threads uh, when it comes to health, because these are they were very siloed, I, I think, uh, these different, you know, advocacies. And, you know, it wasn't until, you know, we sort of teamed up that I was able to um, really feel like my reality was validated. <laughs> and um, and and as I collected more and more of these types of folks around me, we created almost this field of, um, I don't want to say like victimhood, but it was it was some sort of an energy of uh, us against them where we feel smaller, you know, fundamentally than the them that we are fighting. Mm -hmm. And so it's this kind of like David and Goliath energy, but really what it is, I think, is a recapitulation of that same trauma field of the... Uh, you know, the, the child parent, um, you know, sort of rebellion against the, the abuser. And yeah, in some of yeah. your articles, you, you write specifically about the parentification of the relationship with all of these people, you know, wearing masks and submitting to mandates vis-a-vis uh, -vis the state. Yes. I do think that's very, very more relevant probably than any other variable. You know, every time I, I see somebody calling people stupid or dumb who are, you know, sort of falling for it or, you know, who are otherwise uh, in lockstep with, with what's unfolding, it always seems off to me, you know, and not because I'm some like virtuous non-name caller, but because I don't believe that that's actually the rate limiting step. Now they've been fluoridating our water for some time. So, you know, obviously the IQ issue could be a, a relevant one, but I do think that trauma and specifically um, the arrested development of our own sense of selves um, as a collective and, and certainly as Americans, right? Because we're, we're not initiated uh, at any particular phase um, beyond our child psychology into our sovereign adult grasp on what it is that we can handle and how it is that we can relate to fear and specifically fear of death. Uh, because we're not initiated, we're kind of a bunch of kids, you know, running around in our programs pretending that we know what the hell we're doing, you know? And so we're very susceptible to this uh, relationship to externalized authority um, and the fear of that authority that would lead us to either defy or comply. And I know that, you know, I went, I flipped from compliance to defiance uh, in, in the setting of my uh, recovery and remission of my illness, so-called, and it took me many years. Uh, I'm still in the process of identifying that path beyond, right? The sovereignty path that is non-referential. It is non-oppositional. Um, it allows to be what is and navigates from an internal resource of authority. And that's not just sort of like a hallmark, like, you know, sort of here's how you own yourself kind of a thing. It's, it's a through line that ties your your every behavior, your every decision, your every experience of emotion together um, around a core of self that is unperturbable, you know, and I, I, I I'm not there yet. 
Well, I'm not either. And I, and, I, and it's, it's a goal of mine. And I, I use different rhetorical strategies as a writer to try to reach different audiences. So sometimes maybe I will call people stupid who are, who are acting <laughs> way, right. But I don't necessarily in my heart believe that's the only thing going on. I think there's a yeah. perfect storm of a dumbing down to our educational system, a removing yeah. of information and censoring uh, and uh, fluoridation and other, other uh you know, pesticides and toxins that, that actually do affect our neurobiology. Yes. All of these are problematic. And then you combine that with lack of sort of, sort of a systemic lack of individuation. Yes. And any kind of initiation ritual to allow us to face our own mortality and step into adulthood with all of that entails, you know, then you're really looking at a kind of bad situation. I remember in, in graduate school, I was, uh, I read this, uh, Brazilian story that fascinated me. And I thought for a long time, if I ever got around to writing my dissertation, which I was, I never got to do because of my, my illness, I was going to work on this, this concept of transcending duality in, in, the, in a liter from a literary lens. And it was called the third riverbank. Okay. So that was the name of the story. So if you just think about that for a second, there, there is logically no third riverbank. Right. There's two, that's the world that we're living in, but somehow there's this third one that allows you to arrive at a different shore and step out onto a new land, new ground. Mm -mm. And I thought that is the most amazing metaphor for where I'm trying to go in my life. Mm -mm. And how we probably can't envision that destination, right? From where it is that we are, uh, standing you know I, th I think that's very true at this moment that where it is that we are destined to go uh first of all it's unfold it's it's being written and it's also written you know that kind of paradox uh but it's very not meta that, yeah it's not something that we can even really perceive um from where it is that we stand and i think that resolves the duality because otherwise we feel our options are you know to homeschool or to put our kids in masks, you know, or our options are to get vaccinated or not. Um, and it's this this very sort of, uh, it's a dialectic. And obviously that's a big part of how it is that they have um, infinitely divided us into thousands and thousands of camps so that we are in these teeny, teeny echo, echo chambers, um, making sure that we're only ever in safe spaces with people who agree with us and, uh, keeping our, our sights very low, set very low, um, so that we can't perceive the grand mandala, you know, that we are all creating together. Oh, that's beautifully stated. It really is. There's a, there's a guy I listen to sometimes who talks about cryptocurrency. His name's Bitcoin Ben, and he's a real character. Um, he's being hired by companies to come in and talk about crypto and that kind of thing. And I don't agree with all of his perspectives and, and, and that sort of thing, but he has this idea that is very in alignment with a lot of my, my research into consciousness and the way that reality is created, that essentially we are going through a kind of ignoring process. Those of us who are beginning to wake up, where we are beginning to simply ignore all of this top-down overreach. Mm. Mm. And that in, the, in that process, we, we do, in fact, begin to create that third riverbank, that new reality where, where new systems, new agreements, new possibilities begin to sort of spontaneously man manifest. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, I think that at every sort of juncture, um, there is, I almost envision like this, like, accordion, you know, sort of uh, fanning out of so many different potential paths forward. And I think the, the challenge of the activist is often, I'll speak from my experience historically, that we so want to be right about what it is that we are foreseeing, that when things, you know, when the vaccine passport came around, those of us in the vaccine advocacy world have been talking about a passport for the better part of 10 or 15 years. And so when it came around, you know, many of us were like, you see, I told you so. <laughs> and we right. get to be right about how wronged it is that we are. And so this um, victim consciousness, I think, collapses those potentialities pretty much on the spot. 
uh, because we're so preoccupied with the validation of our um, negativity, really, and this sense that we have that really the world is 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 not a good place, right? It's a, it's a place that we have to struggle and survive. And the alternative seems to be a bypass, right? Like a, a sort of pretending that you're asleep, uh, kind of an option, right? And, and just sort of like letting go, rolling with the punches and kind of letting things unfold. And to somebody who has this stirring inside of angst around all that is wrong in the world, that doesn't feel available. Uh, but what about everything in between, right? Because that's the creative space from which regeneration, let, let alone creation, springs forth. I mean, I know that uh, in, in my process, I, I walked away from, certainly not entirely, but I intentionally focused my energy um, off of exposing the truth, right? Because that's a whole, you can make a whole life out of that, um, exposing the truth and really for my own salvation, uh, chose to focus on, you know, the, 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 what's possible, right? So the, the, the feeling of inspiration, the feeling of expansion, um, and the real life experiences that are, were around me are around me that demonstrate to me that what I thought was impossible, in fact, is possible. And obviously in my arena that that's mostly in the health world and these outcomes, medical outcomes that, you know, have not since been uh, or not previously been reported and every time I would hear one of these stories or graduate one of these patients from my practice I would I would feel this exaltation you know I would I would cry mm. special yeah. kind of tears and uh, that became the compass by which I would navigate like the next best choice but I found that in this phase of my process focusing on creating that new world um, that new story, that new reality, um, that actually I have to titrate exposure to my nervous system of that which I thought I wanted, right? I, I had an experience recently. Well, actually, so it was back in... You have, to, you have to introduce limited quantities of that, yes. of that reality. Yeah, because I'm not ready for it, actually. You know, and I, and I can want it. I can want harmony and peace and happiness and and love all I want, but I'm not actually ready for it on a neurobiological level, I am, you know, habituated and addicted to struggle, um, to conflict, and to whatever it is, you know, that I get out of figuring out how to be right about something. Um, and, I, and my ego can hide in all sorts of sneaky places, including admitting that I'm wrong, right? Because then I get to be right about how I admit that I'm wrong when I'm wrong, you know? And this process of, you know, shadow work has been um, the most essential part of my uh, public and private work for the past several years because I have a sense that if I don't commit to that chiefly, uh, that I will invite experiences <laughs> um, that will be something like cosmic two by fours, you know, that will mm. slap me upside the face and give me no other choice than to look at the incoherence that I am uh, embodying, you know. Well, you uh, mentioned the, the, the trauma that we carry, and uh, I imagine you're familiar with, uh, is it Paul Levy's work in somatic experiencing? Yes. And so titration is a very important concept exactly. in, that, in that work. The, the, the concept being, and correct me if I'm wrong, because you probably know more about this than I do, but if, you, if, you, if you're trying to let the, uh, help the body release this held trauma, you can't mm -hmm. do it in large doses. You, can't, you cannot stimulate that release in large doses or you'll create more problems. That's exactly right. And that's exactly where I got this concept of titration is from the somatic experiencing world. And the, the often uh, large gap that can exist between desire and capacity. And I, uh, I think it involves, you know, sort of a, a patience and compassion with the self that sees the journey towards a goal of wholeness, a goal of peace, a goal of happiness, uh, as not necessarily being the destination we thought it was, and more being a metric by which we assess, you know, sort of where it is that we are on our journey. And the journey <laughs> is perhaps what it is that we enjoy, right? Not necessarily sort of getting to this fantasy place, that oasis on the horizon, you know? 
that's ever receding, getting to this fantasy place of, of arrival. Um, and that perspective helps us to settle in, you know, to what's happening in the world right now. And even on some level, relish it. You know, I think um, having children has made that feel inaccessible to me personally, uh, because I know, or I don't know, I, I suspect that if I were, you know, a single woman, um, I could sort of be like, wow, I chose to come in at this time. What a wild ride, you know. Uh, but something <laughs> about, you know, looking at my my children having chosen to come in and experience, you know, childhood uh, the way that they are, as much as they are not a part of the average, you know, collective, um, it's still an energetic reality for them that, you know, they, they chose to come in at this time and it's a really creepy time to, to be a kid. And that feels like it really uh, engenders a sense of, I guess, um, like a grief, kind of, I think. I know that and, so well. I mean, I'm a yeah. father and I've had that, this just heart-wrenching feeling at yeah. times, looking at the world my, my, my son is moving into. It's just, yeah. oh my goodness gracious. I, I would not want, I want it to be in his shoes. Right. Uh, on the other hand, going, going back to something you said earlier, this whole idea that the the journey is the destination yeah and that we're meant on some level to embrace that process and that that process of unfolding it, it taps into philosophically at least and maybe biologically well i imagine biologically this idea of neuroplasticity mm -hmm. that that especially as we age if we're not taking on new experiences we're kind of ossifying yes and at some point in time if you ossify enough guess what you're dead Yes. So we have to actually embrace the journey to even keep moving, moving uh, forward as living beings. Yes. <laughs> you know, yes. And then and then there's the idea of the kind of adventure. I, I used to have this metaphor and it, it showed up in my the very first novel that I put out. It was this idea of being a kind of mariner on the sea, on the ocean. Right. And 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 that the that feeling of just the sea spray kind of hitting your face and you're on the this wild sea and that's that's what life is and there's nothing like it and it's really scary and really exhilarating all at the same time yes and i think to, to remember to be yeah. said for just embracing yeah. where we are because there are also all of these possibilities that are bubbling up beneath all of this tyranny yes we've all experienced it I mean, I, I, I don't know anybody who hasn't experienced an acceleration, you know, transformation, growth, alchemical process, the discovery of a truth that was thinly veiled previously. I mean, we've all uh, experienced something extraordinary that we could call feeling alive in the past year and a half that on some level we know wouldn't have been made available to us, certainly not in the timeline that it has been now, had this whole totalitarian world takeover button not been pushed <laughs> right right yeah. right do you do you think um you know we're kind of going all over the place but do you think that um there's anything like a race against time here i what i mean is that the the would-be controllers here they push the button and they're not they're not stupid and they knew that they would it would engender a kind of awakening and you can see that like you just said and that's happening across all areas and all demographics etc so there is it seems to me that there is a there is a kind of race against time maybe uh, between uh, the world being shut down to their standards and specifications and our and our kind of crumbling their old paradigm just just by an act of of uh, courageous existence. Yes. I think it's going to require something unexpected. And so I don't believe that the race against time concept, at least in my reality, is is operative because I think that it's being created now. You know, like as we were discussing, all of these um, possibilities are so non reflecting. a nonlinear type of unexpected event. Is that yes? Yeah, and maybe even um, you know a sort of convergence of of unexpected forces, right? So, like for me, for example. Um, getting very, very clear on the energetic coherence of my no. Uh, you know, I'm Italian, Irish, I got a big mouth and I know how to say no. I've, I've been a rebellious, you know, kid <laughs> since I was probably like one. And 
Nonetheless, there are so many areas of my life where I have that mealy mouth, sort of like half yes, half no, no please, no maybe, you know, and a lot of it is around my relationship. You know, like I got off my smartphone in December, that felt big. I still shop on Amazon. That feels shameful, you know. I you know, started to grow my own food and, you know, integrate my relationship to animals. And, you know, all of this work had to be done before I can stand in a no that does not require explanation, validation, protest, or anything else. Because the, the pillar of power that that simple one word of energy contains is its own defined field. But then what is my yes, right? And so... Most of my work um, recently has been on in the erotic realm, actually, and um, I have like coaches and you know body workers and and people that I am um, recruiting to support my relationship to my own erotic energy. And the reason that I, in the midst of Rome burning, <laughs> have decided you know to focus on expanding that dimension of my human experience is because I do believe it may be the antidote. Uh, I do believe that this is a, you know, it's a frequency that is largely inaccessible, if not entirely inaccessible to those who are, you know, we're playing this game with. Um, and that it is extremely defiant in a way that is, um, that feels very sovereign to me. You know, like I remember I was listening to this uh, therapist I used to see, Esther Perel, who does a lot of, uh, she, you know, sex and couples therapy work. And she was speaking to one of her patients uh, in a recorded audio. And this patient had experienced sexual abuse. And she was talking about the kind of reclamation that you experience when you have erotic intimacy with a partner, when you have a history of sexual abuse is the ultimate empowerment, right? It's the ultimate fuck you. It's the ultimate, um, you know, you did not, you cannot, and you will not take this from me. I still have it. And you can't take it, right? So it's Marvin that... Gaye was right all along. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. We just need sexual healing. Exactly. And, you know, it's not, it's not, the work that I'm doing is not necessarily partner-based, you know, it's about intimacy with my own energy field, um, the yin and yang within me, right? The masculine feminine within me, um, really getting to know, you know, my body, really getting to know what it is that I call, you know, pleasure and preference, um, bringing a playful energy into, you know, the, the, the shrapnel laden battlefield, that charnel ground. Uh, and so I, you know, that's just an idea I've had recently is that these kind of unexpected um, energies that we can bring into play may, you know, open up spaces that otherwise would feel collapsed on either side, right? Because right now, we don't want to go back to the way things were. We can't. They told us we can't and we can't. We don't want to anyway. And I love you know, that. We don't want to anyway. That's so spot on. It's true, right? So yeah. the new normal, that phrase that we all have been gagging about for a year and a half. I mean, you know, what is the new normal, right? So so they're defining it in a certain dehumanizing way, uh, transhumanizing way, however you want to look at it. Um, but we also have an opportunity to, you know, throw our hat in the ring. And we just, I, I, I'll speak for myself, like, I'm not so sure that we have um, really inhabited what it is that we want to create aside from some kind of like older concepts of like, you know, living with mother nature and living off the land. And that's all wonderful, but it's going to take something novel. It's going to take that quantum leap, as you said, into a whole new understanding of not just technology free living, but something that is uh, an expansion from a place of our human impulse that I'm not sure we've been in touch with for, for some time. And I, I would call that Eros. I do think that that's uh, a place to well, locate it. The, I had a couple of thoughts and one of them involves some work that I've done that I wanted to bring into this discussion specifically about this. Um, but the first is that when you're tapping into your yes, you're also empowering your no 
Mm -hmm. And I would imagine vice versa, ultimately, because you kind of tracked from the no to the yes, as you were describing your process. Yeah. So there's a reciprocal nature there. There's a real yin and yang going on that I, I think is very powerful that, you, that you're, you're touching on because you're talking about the kind of the whole apparatus there, our ability to, to, you know, to move in both directions, to, to flow in different patterns. I think it's, it's incredibly human and incredibly powerful. And it taps into this whole idea of, of what the real, I guess, divine energy is that you're talking about when you're getting into Eros, which I think has, has a name. I think it's Kundalini. Mm. That this is the energy from the earth. It's literally the energy given to us by the mother, the mother mm -hmm. earth that comes up through our, our grounding in the earth, our feet into the rest of our bodies and completely up into our, our, our brains at some point, if we can let it get up in there. Yes. I just wrote a, a book that, uh, that was published a few months ago. It's a novel, but it's really a, about the pandemic. It's a future dystopian book. It's called Callie the Destroyer. Yes. And there's a, there's a movement, there's a moment when Callie is understanding her connection with the goddess and with the goddess's energy. And I just want to read these two little tiny moments to, because it taps directly into what you've been saying. As Callie caught her breath, she experienced a moment of body awareness reminiscent of the pure awareness she tapped into during her escape from Freddy's assassins in Saturnia. In this instance, she caught a glimpse of Kundalini, the source of which she intuited to be merely a powerful aeonic emotion rising through her legs and up her spine like a coiling snake. Recalling her mother's comment that Kundalini and anger were similar, Callie asked, how long did it take you to know, really know in your bones, that the goddess is just a type of person, one who feels things super intensely maybe, but otherwise much like people do. And the, the response by her teacher is much longer than you, it would seem. Hmm. I like that. So I think, you know, part of what we're talking about here is really reconnecting with our, our maternal source in this planet in the earth in a, in a literal physical uh, atomic sense and in an energetic sense as well. There have been so many strategies, it seems to me, that have been designed to cut us off from that connection. In fact, the, the, the notion of goddess worship was systemically, systematically uh, hunted down through various inquisi inquisitions in which millions and millions and millions of people died. So somebody in that controlling class is terrified of humans having this connection reestablished. I just have so many thoughts, uh, you know, unfolding because this has been a, a space that I've been deeply occupying recently, even in my own shadow work, because I have, you know, I think most of us are conditioned to feel there is something deeply unlovable at our core, right? And my flavor of that has been, you know, sort of uh, an identification with something like the Medusa archetype, right? That I have this dark energy in the core of myself that is highly destructive and that is irrepressible, right? So I open my mouth, I destroy things, you know? Mm. I speak my truth, people hate me. Kelly the Destroyer. Uh, yeah, and, and fundamentally, you know, this archetype can dress herself up and it's actually part of, you know, embodying the archetype is you, you know, you get gifted, you know, beauty and charisma and all the things so you can hide that ugly, you know, core self um, that that you know dark witch inside and I have spent the greater part of my you know adult life feeling like no one actually could possibly love me it's not actually possible because it's like I'm made of knives right and if they went to hug me I would cut them up you know so how could they possibly love me um, and as I have come into a deeper intimacy with myself I've I'm getting, I'll say, I wouldn't say I've gotten to, but I'm getting to a place where I can begin, begin, begin to, you know, embrace this aspect of, of who it is that I feel I am and be okay, you know, with the fact that others may not show me, you know, what it is that I am starting to feel 
for myself because previous to that it would feel so painful um, especially in partnership you know if I would be reflected that I you know I have these ugly parts that are like everybody wishes would stay in the closet <laughs> you know so I just keep the pretty parts out and uh, that right, would just right. reinforce this 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 split for me but in order to inhabit a world you know that holds the destructive energies so that uh, the creative energies can you know play their very specific role um, that that sort of equal playing field like the embrace of both um, is essential and it probably starts with a relationship to ourself you know i was thinking just today how self-betrayal um, and the resolution of self-betrayal but at least the awareness of the moments in which we do it right so i was just getting my car cleaned while i was at a dance class before this um, interview there's this like guy who you know cleans the car by hand in the back of the dance studio and i was going to be late for this interview because he was like too detail oriented and taking forever, like wiping all these things I don't care about. Okay, I just, if, as long as there's not like <laughs> crumbs on the seat, I'm good. So he said, okay, give me like five minutes, but I didn't really have five minutes. And I was like, okay, okay. That little experience, I watched myself betray myself so that I could maintain some sort of amicable connection to this stranger, pretty much. I said, okay, when it actually wasn't okay for me. Right? These little instances of self-violation create this very unstable foundation for understanding who it is that we are. And then we perceive all that is outside of us <laughs> through that, that limited understanding of who it is that we are. So we, in my worldview, we project all of these unsavory aspects of self on the outside, right? So if I have not yet embraced this Medusa within, then you better believe I'm going to experience and fight with it on the outside. Um, and that, I think, is the invitation, right? To, to really focus our energies on the inside while maintaining sufficient awareness of the environment and what it is continuing to reflect to us. Oh, that you just hit it so beautifully. And you, this is what you got into in that recent healing conference. I mean, you really were, were all over this topic. Uh, and a question I had listening then, and, and uh, I have it now too, although, although I'm, I'm even clearer on what you're saying. Uh, my question has to do with how to, how to embody both the sacred feminine and the sacred masculine, because that's what my book is about too. It's, it's mm. you, not just the goddess. There's also a God. They're, they're mm. lovers. It's a, it's mm. a tantric cosmic love story of twin flames and, and and but it's also symbolic of who we are as individuals and microcosmically yes. so how how do we go within and work on projecting that type of reality outside of ourselves that we want that is more harmonized why which i would consider to be a feminine uh, movement inward yeah. while standing our ground on the outside as a warrior and if if need be fighting to save our loved ones and I would consider yeah. that to be more of an archetypal masculine. And I'm, I'm not genderizing these things. I'm just no, talking I mean, archetypes. Yes, no caveats needed. <laughs> yes, I think this is absolutely um, some of the most important work we can be doing right now. And, and I know that I have grounded this in some very practical applications. Um, I've really enjoyed the work of a woman who is uh, both a world-class dominatrix and a Taoist nun. Uh, her name is Kazia Urbaniak, and she wrote a book called Unbound, which um, was very game-changing for me. And essentially what she encourages is to organize your energies, right? Um, into what she calls the dom and the sub energies. But of course, you know, you can call it masculine, feminine, yin, yang. These polarities within um, to, to organize the energies inside yourself, behaviorally, emotionally, um, the thought-based experiences that we have into domains is, I think, um, the beginning of very empowered dynamics with the outer world. And most of us uh, are enculturated to really blend and mix and that's sort of the shadow of all of the UN agenda you know 2030 which says you know we're all one and we're all you know here to 
um, come together uh, as this united front and of course the gender neutralization and all of these efforts to um, so-called multiculturalism which is uh, anything but that this dilution of difference into a sea of sameness sounds wonderful and it has a beautiful impulse of course a divine impulse um, embedded somewhere within it we're not there yet folks <laughs> you know first you got to organize the black part of the yin you know the yang and the white part of the yin and then then the little dots get put there you know you we have to organize we're in that um that moment where i've experienced it metaphorically as like as if we're this organism right and we're all different kinds of cells actually and you got to find your liver cell buddies if you're a liver cell right you don't right, belong right. in the eyeball and we have cell walls for a reason um, and and we can only start to harmonize in this metabiont once we understand who the hell we are right so mm. as i'm doing this inner polarity work um for example i have decided <laughs> that it's really essential for me to get clear about what energy i want to inhabit so if i'm going to ask sayer um to take out the garbage <laughs> whatever um am i going to do that from my yang energy or am i going to do that from my yin energy my yang energy is very outwardly focused like you said it's that protector um, it's that decision maker it's that one at the perimeter of the castle and that yang energy already knows what needs to be done and is executing behaviorally on that, right? So if I ask him from, I'm just making this up off the cuff, but if I ask him from that yang energy, I'll say, you're gonna take the garbage out before we go out to dinner. Let me know if you need anything for that, okay? I'm telling him what to do, I'm focused on him. But if I'm gonna ask him from my yin, right? From my connection to intuition, to the feeling space, to that sentient, wordless knowing of the interior, then I'm going to focus inward and I'm going to focus on my experience and I'm going to invite him into a reality that I'm already inhabiting. So I might say something like, you know what, when you, when you take the garbage out, I feel like a queen, <laughs> right? It, it just makes me feel so taken care of and I would really, really love it if you would take the garbage out before we go out to dinner. Does that work for you? Something like that, right? So, and the, the energetic signature of those two different comportments, um, those are two versions of myself, almost in caricature. But when I learn to inhabit each of them and I feel how different they are, then I can organize myself, right? So if I am reading a news headline and I feel this righteous anger come up in me, I'm not going to discuss the the topic from this sort of apologetic, like, oh yeah, well, everybody has their own opinions and I guess it's okay, kind of, no. I'm gonna coherently inhabit that versus, you know, the alternative. And it's a practice. It's a practice of reacquainting ourselves with um, an organized version of that which has been fundamentally disordered through <laughs> uh, decades of, of social engineering and, you know, millennia of trauma. So are you, are you touching on this previous concept that I, that I used a metaphor for the third riverbank, this third modality, because it seems to me when in this organizational activity that you're describing these two modalities, that there's a potential, uh, there's maybe the potential for a third integrated way of acting or being exactly yeah and the word that i would i would use you know to describe the field from which you know that bank would would spring um is complementarity you know I, I remember at the beginning of this pandemic our um and you might have heard me tell this simple story but our friends at the time uh this is very very early on like the first month in invited us up to dinner at their I don't know, I guess you'd call it like a country house or whatever. Uh, it's funny in Florida, it doesn't really apply. But anyway, <laughs> um, you know, and they invited us up to dinner. And we said, wow, yes, we would love to because uh, Miami had just gone into crazy lockdown. They even closed the beaches. It was absurd. Uh, so we, we said, yeah, yeah, we'll be there. And then 
the guy was, he's very charming and he was like, okay, just FYI, you know, we're social distancing. So like, you know, it's, it's no thing, but we're, you know, we're just going to set the table like in a certain way. And I'm, we're just going to not like hug you when you arrive. Okay. See you soon. And, uh, I was like, dude, we're not coming. <laughs> like, right. That does not work for me. I do not act or behave in, in these dehumanizing ways ways with people that I actually care about. So that would be like really unpleasant experience for me. So we're not going to, we're not going to come. And it felt important for me to introduce, of course, I didn't feel even I had a choice, but to introduce the concept of consequences around caution, you know, because I think culturally you only get, you know, points. So you get virtue points for being cautious, but we're in this moment where actually there are social consequences now, if you choose to abide by the, the cautious, sort of approach. And at that moment, I saw like, wow, this third riverbank is necessary, right? Because if this guy feels that just being in a room with my body is intolerably unsafe for him, and I feel that being in a room with his body in the way that he needs it to be, you know, whether it's wearing a mask or apart from me or whatever, is intolerable to my human sensibilities, then we can't be in the room together. But how is that actually the solution? Is that possibly the destination? So there must be some other way that we can be in the room. And I can't envision it at this moment. But I know that once we get really organized and internally coherent in this holofractal way we've been talking about, right? So I organize my own house. I organize my external world that's proximate to me. And then I start to relate to the, the greater world you know, from that you know, sort of organized perspective, it will become clear. But I do think that right now we're in this phase of developing self-intimacy sufficient to develop intimacy interpersonally in ways that are far deeper and more healthy than ever um, were available to us. And from that point of really kind of getting ourselves organized, I have to believe that as you're saying, you know, this third riverbank will appear. So, so you were providing a perspective of a, a woman's perspective on, on that integration. What advice or recommendations or thoughts would you give to men listening today to begin tapping into that, that resolution of complementarity? Mm. I have learned through my relationship never to give men advice. <laughs> so. uh, maybe from a clinical perspective. <laughs> 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 oh my God, no, it's, I'm actually totally serious because I do think that something on tap for men, and you would be far more qualified to um, affirm this, is a resolution of old dynamics around the mother archetype. You know, I do think that in so many, <laughs> okay, you're right. So like in so many uh, romantic dynamics that I see, but not only like sibling dynamics, um, male-female dynamics, there is something that I observe in, in men that is, um, you know, Sayer refers to it as the vagina dentata. Like it's this right, ex right. experience, right, of, the, of a woman's passion, her intensity. Um, well, it's back to the Medusa thing too, right? Yeah, it's a bit back to that, right? So it's, it's related for sure. Um, that, that there is a fear that he will, will be consumed and obliterated if he aligns with, supports, advocates for, or in other ways, leaves his post to go visit her terrain, right? However, if he defends, avoids, dismisses, derides, or in other ways attempts to have some sort of separate but equal agree to disagree, I'll stay over here while you're over there, a woman will never respect that. She will never trust that. And so he loses either way. So there is some experience that I think is becoming available to men that is the sovereign individuation, you know, at, at impulse at its, at, at its core, which is to say, I can hold the container for your experience. I can lean in with curiosity, compassion, and interest, and I will be unmoved, you know, in ways that are essential to my 
core masculine line, right? You can spiral mm -hmm. around all you want and need. And I will allow myself to be informed, you know, by your experience. Um, and I've got this no matter what, right? So there is something, you know, again, I'm speaking from a woman's perspective about what it is that I think we want. And it, it requires the resolution of the projection of the bad mother. Um, and once that happens, like, like the woman's role would be really to stop telling men what the hell to do. Truly stop. Just stop. Stop knowing better than they do what they need, which we feel we do. And maybe we do, actually. <laughs> maybe it's part of our capacity. Um, maybe it's part of our corpus callosum, you know, being bigger, whatever it is. Right. That we are very attuned, you know, to what it is that might be needed next. Uh, however, when we occupy that role of director, of general, of contractor, um, we activate that archetype. And so the way to part co-participate, I guess, in the resolution and integration of that bad mommy archetype and its associated painful projection might be that we stop telling men what to do. <laughs> we allow them um, to have their experience while focusing on you know, that submissive energy, that I energy, that, that feeling energy, and really um, keeping the focus inward with appropriate expression um, so that men can start to recognize that they can navigate by that, right? That there is an experience of that male-female complementarity, masculine-feminine comp complementarity, where the masculine navigates by the compass of the feminine intuition, um, perhaps internally, but certainly in partnership. And that is only really made available when these old dynamics of, you know, one person is right and the other is wrong. One person is in power while the other is, you know, helpless. These old dynamics of parody um, games are, are resolved and we come into that complementarity. Oh, that's beautiful. And that's really, really beautiful. I, I like that from a philosophical standpoint, from a kind of a, a mental, a, a mental perspective. I, I was, I was having a, a complimentary thought process as you, as you were sharing that it had to do with men, men's need to get into their bodies more and into their relationship with the mother on a, on a physical level. I I've experienced this in a couple of different ways. Personally, one is through something as simple as earthing. Yes. You know, when you're standing on the, on the earth in bare feet, and realizing that you are drawing in this healing energy, that you have an actually positive relationship with, with the, the great mother. Yes. And then becoming, uh, you know, very masculine, perhaps in the way that you experience that relationship with things like primal movement. And you can look that up. That's a kind of a burgeoning movement, ha ha, these days. And yes. it's not just for men, but a lot of men are into it. And it's kind of taking exercise back to you and your body and the ground. Yes. And when you do that in a conscious way and in a flow way where you're exploring your body and its relationship to the earth, there is, you begin to establish a new relationship with the mother, I would argue. And it like begins that. to flow into you. Your body starts to change. You get stronger. You get more agile. I think it probably helps with a lot of degenerative and other strange conditions. Although I'm not a doctor, so you know that's just my my uh, my belief. And it it brings energy and awareness throughout your system at different levels. It's actually very miraculous. I I, I imagine uh, this isn't surprising to you. This 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 uh, perspective I'm sharing. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, Sayer, when he wrote Regenerate, um, he put out a masterclass and the movement part of it was exactly exactly this. And I, I do think that there are ways in the natural world that we engage that complementarity. I mean, I know, for example, on the antithetical um, side of it is when I was in Manhattan. You know, when I when I worked in Manhattan, I was so perfused with masculine energy from the field that is that city. Um, that being in, you know, by the beach in my, mm. you know, jungly little spot here in Miami, um, an entirely different part of myself is drawn forth. Uh, so I do think that that 
that play with your environment um, and the way that your body inhabits the environment is one of the ways you begin to sense like, oh, here's this part of me. <laughs> it's it's more attracted to what's happening, you know, outside of me in this given environment than another one. Yeah, I can see what you're saying about about New York and, and uh, you know, having I'm in Florida myself and at yes. the beach and it's just such a different world to, you know, to come from from more urban environments, uh, mountain environments, whatever, you know, this is like really, really, uh, you know, uh, it, it invites that kind of fluid relationship to reality, that more feminine way of being, I suppose. Yes. But it provides the ground on which you can, you can work on the masculine aspects of the psyche and the body. Yes. I like that. Yeah. And that kind of mastery experience that we long for around so many aspects of being human, uh, whether it's emotional or physical or uh, intellectual, I think is a way to align with the ego that probably isn't here necessarily to be transcended or stomped on or, you know, cut into bits, you know, that, you that impulse. That. Yeah. I think it's really important. I think that that's something that that's like an old trope that needs to be exactly swept under the rug of history. You know, I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this has been, uh, you're, you know, you're so incredible and we could, we could talk about a million different things, but I want to, I want to respect your time. I, I wanted to uh, just ask if you have any uh, closing thoughts and also if you could provide uh, any information on, on any new projects or other places to, to find you and your work. Hmm. Thank you. I mean, it's such a pleasure, you know, to to be able to um, ramble together in the wilderness, you know, of, of these topics. It's um, it's very expansive for me to really think outside of the box of the the sort of dialectic of uh, viruses and <laughs> vaccines and everything else, and really explore, you know, what it is that um, comes with with this terrain. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think that one of, one of the things I, I like to reinforce for folks is that, um, that that sense of trust, that what it is that you need, whether it's a person or a resource or a connection uh, to progress to this sort of next chapter for yourself, it will appear, you know, if you hold the desire. I've become very interested as an extension of my uh, erotic explorations in the power of desire and how when we identify the desires that are underneath our complaints, for example, or the desires that are underneath our, our grief or our anger or even our shame, that we begin to collect um, all of these sort of um, magnets, you know, that, that then attract exactly what it is that we are ready for and in the, in the titration that we are ready for it. So um, that connecting to that trust is very settling, I think, to the nervous system. So, yeah, I mean, who knows what I'm up to? I like to <laughs> be in a dynamic state of always changing and always um, following, you know, my intuition to the next um, field of exploration. And I spend most of my time these days in our membership, Vital Life Project, where uh, I've come to appreciate that there is um, there is a role, like we were saying, in, in this organizational phase for being with like minds so that you can have that letdown of fight or flight and really be vulnerable in your exploration of these new subjects, these new topics, um, and really start to dip your toe into places that you would have otherwise felt were unavailable to you. I know for me it's been really expansive to suck at a lot of new things, you know, like playing guitar and growing vegetables and sewing and uh, <laughs> pottery, you know, I've, I've gotten really comfortable with just like not being good at things and being a novice. And it's been humbling in all the right ways. Um, it's relieved a lot of the fear I've had around my sense of worth coming from my expertise, for example, that of course was enculturated from my particular uh, cult based <laughs> training. So yeah, that's a, that's a space where I, I spend a lot of my energy and, and time these days. Well, that sounds like a good place to be. And I want to encourage people to, to visit your website again. At the address, uh, it's not in front of me. Could you give us that address one last time? Oh, yeah, sure. It's just kellybroganmd.com. 
All right. I, I, I want to encourage everybody to check it out, to, to read, to read uh, Dr. Kelly's books uh, or, you know, this, the, the, uh, this one book that really caused quite a stir, the, uh, the one I mentioned earlier, I, I read it years ago and it's, uh, oh yeah, Mind of Your Own. Yes. I, remember, I remember that one, uh, that one really, uh, didn't it get censored at some point? Yeah, it was, um, it was blacklisted. Blacklisted, uh, that's right. Pretty wild ride. And of course, not unexpected. I mean, it was published by a top five publisher, HarperCollins, and, and it was, uh, you know, they thought they were going to like waltz me onto the Dr. Oz show with an exploding pill on the front. And I was like, guys, that's, <laughs> these are pharma subsidized outlets. That's not really how it, how it works. Oh, right. Yeah. I remember reading <laughs> was, about that going, oh my gosh, because I, I knew when the book was coming out and I'm like, oh, this is great. It's really going to change things. And, and it did change a lot of things for many people and continues to do so, but not in the ways you probably envision. <laughs> Yeah, it's been sort of like a silent, uh, sort of uh, like a like a fungus taken over slowly. <laughs> like a, a very a really tasty beneficial fungus. <laughs> I like that. <laughs>